Jack is going to be leading us in prayer this morning. Uh, Amanda, can you give us an update on your sister? She's still waiting to see a doctor. They decided instead of doing the test that they would wait to let her see an oncologist and she can't get in until November 1st. My word. She's going to be frustrated because this is going on with more than a month now. Yes, Cindy. Remind me her name. Cindy Lambert. Well, uh, oh, that has just really been going on a long time. Kind of nerve-wracking when she had already survived cancer one time to teach you. Yeah. You know, another one of our class members here, Debbie Robertson. Yeah. Her sister also, her, her sister is Patsy That's Miller, right. likewise waiting for diagnosis and test results. And that's been dragging on a long time, and it's, it's not, not very encouraging. Sarah? Oh, Aaron. Yes, Aaron. He will be seeing a neurologist. Okay. Neurologist. He will be seeing a neurologist. Okay, Aaron Self, he's going to be saying specialist that. Specialist because, yeah, he's been struggling with yeah. um, something. Uh, he's, he's been struggling with since after COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. And he's been to specialist several times. And he's been seeing a neurologist and he's been seeing a specialist. 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 Oh, no, he was taking care of but he's been, yeah, I mean, it tore up, it's, it's bad. Because he could not even function her day. So, really, tell us again your brother-in-law's name. Is it Don Henson? Yes, but she hasn't had it announced down at your own Okay. Yes. okay. Yeah, he's got stage four cancer of the colon and the liver, and it's in the red nose. And he hasn't seen an oncologist the same way on the test or everything like that. But she does have a small contrary with her oncologist. But she's just had her own problem and she just She said she had been asked to do this conversation. So we're just in prayer and then we just tell her friends her. We will have an announcement. She hasn't announced down there. Our brother, Don. Tell her how you doing. As long as you keep on the incline, give them a little bit better. Maybe not as quick as you'd like, but we're, we're glad to have you back again with us again. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you have a good one. Uh, Is Peggy here today? Peggy Bussey. She got out into the aisle and just turned loose and she's up on the up on the front of the stage now. <laughs> <laughs> Roll all the way down front. She came to the She came to Maybe that's not quite the truth. But <laughs> well, you said she was at the stage. She came. I think it was at the stage. righteous Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study a portion of your word, Lord, and we ask that you would be with Bob as he presents this to us, Father, we ask that uh, you would give him a ready recollection of all the things that he has studied and prepared for us, Father, we're so grateful for teachers like Bob that would that would take their time out to uh, to help with this study and help edify us and bring us together, Father, we understand how tough this class is and, and the things that we are going through as a class and the reason for this class. But Father, we know we can always turn to you. Father, we know that uh, you know this list of our sick far better than we ever could. And Father, we're so grateful that uh, you have uh, brought Della back to us and that uh, she has re restored a little bit of, of her health. Father, we're mindful of uh, those who have cancer and those who are struggling. Father, we're mindful of Cindy Lambert and uh, Patsy Noah. Father, we're also mindful of Don his his struggles father we ask that you would be with them and be with all of those that are tending to them father we pray for young Aaron Sylvie that there may be a uh, solution that they may be able to find this quickly and and correct what is wrong there father we ask that you would uh, continue to bless Peggy and Ron and in in her recovery and also Jean Corley's father we're so thankful for you we're thankful for the rain that you sent our way father we we, we pray for more we we understand that most of this country is in a drought, Father, and we ask that you would send rain. Father, we're so thankful for Christ and all that he has done for us and the ability to come 
to you through him. It is in his name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to share some information with you uh, this morning, but we want to begin, as we always do, with reading our basic scripture from 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4 so foundational, so absolutely foundational for what we're, we're looking at, what we're studying. Now the Apostle Paul wrote and writing to Christians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And we cannot overemphasize, we cannot overemphasize that word comfort. But he goes ahead and he says, Who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And that's the part of the class that we're going to be focusing on uh, these next few classes after today. But we've talked about the very different types of grief, talking about grief itself. And this past Sunday, we looked at what are identified as, as the stages of grief, and we made reference to a writing by, by a later lady, an author by the name of Elizabeth Cooper Ross. And, and she identified what she focused on were five different stages of grief, all of which we talked about this past week. That being denial, anger, bargaining, then depression, and also then finally acceptance. But as I suggested to you last week, we're going to add a number six to this stage of grief, and we're going to really be focusing a lot this morning on that, and that stage has to do with hope. A capital letter hope, so very, very important in the scriptures. They're just full, full of occurrences that can give us so much comfort with regards to that. But as it pertains to this subject of managing our grief, uh, this past week I provided you with a handout. It's really sort of a personal thing for Bob Merle with regards to what has helped me and continues to and is a tool of mine in, in endeavoring to manage grief. And, a very important part of that are the spiritual resources. And I have a number of very relevant, very pertinent scriptures listed there. I and mean, if you didn't get one last week, you're certainly welcome to pick one up. There should be some back on the table there. But in addition to the spiritual resources, I also listed, and, and here it gets, it gets a little bit personal, and some of this uh, does not apply to you. If you were to make your own list, Undoubtedly, you come up with some things that are different and some that I have that, that you would not have. But that includes personal resources and also relationships, uh, all of which I think are, are extremely important and is, again, it, it's very, very helpful for me. But I want to, as we talk about the personal resources, I want to bring to your attention, I want to ask, the, this is of the ladies, uh, or, or did any of you, any of the ladies in here, do you recall, it was I believe about six years ago, that we had a lady speaker who came here for one by the name of Pat Scott? Did anyone remember Pat? I remember coming, but for some reason I didn't get to attend because I have a book and I really want to hear her. Well, it, it's, the, the book is entitled Batten Down the Hatches, and this is a true story. Pat Scott uh, was involved in, in a horrendous situation, and I think this was in 2000, or 1994, was, was uh, not nine, yeah. Uh, she, her husband uh, was an elder in the church. They lived in the Dallas area, and as they came home one evening and they got out of their car, a thief came up, attacked them, killed her husband, right in front of her. And she had to endure that. And, and then following that murder, uh, Pat 
had to attend several trials as they, they caught the, the individual and, and tried it. But she wrote this book entitled Batten Down the Hatches. And in my studies, I had learned of the book. I found out about her, and I contacted her. Now, this was in, uh, I think, 2016. I contacted her and asked her if she would come and speak at uh, one of our ladies' retreats, which she did. And boy, the response from everyone who was there was just so, so wonderful and so positive. And she, what, a, what a sweet lady she was. Now, unfortunately, she passed away about a year ago. And she was in her late eighties, so she lived a good long life. But what a, what a wonderful, wonderful lady. Well, as a part of this book, and, and, and as a part of Bob's personal efforts and endeavors to, to try to manage grief. Uh, she came out, there, there are a couple of statements that I gleaned from that book, and I want to share with you in this in a personal way, and, and one of them, and, and I've got copies of each one of these on the back table for anyone who wants to get a copy. If you don't, fine. But I can tell you both of these that I'm going to share with you for several years now. I have actually taped to to the walls of uh, a, a door doorway that I see each and every day, and it serves to be a source of encouragement and motivation to me. And, and one of them, and as she states in her book, things turn out best for those who make the best of the way things turn out. And, and I don't know about you, but I find myself occasionally, I mean, how did in the world did this happen? How did my life turn out this way? And so often, the reaction may be that we just give up. But again, I think this is pretty profound. It could, uh, this is, a, it's not in Proverbs, but it's uh, from, from the, the book of uh, Second Luke, the third book. No, it, it could have been something. The underlying basis. But again, things turn out best for those who make the best of the way things turn out. I see this every morning. I've got it. I can't shave without having to open that door and see that before I have it. The other one that I have, and and, and this is, is really a goal, and I can tell you I fall so, so far short. But it, it's, it, it ought to be a goal for each and every one of us. And, and this statement just really caught me when I read this, and that is, I want to strive to be the most Christ-like person that I know. We can all think about individuals in our lives who are Christ-like, who have the qualities and the characteristics that Christ had and that he teaches us in his word, and sort of a role model, in a sense. Well, my goal is to strive, and I'll never get there, but to strive to be the most Christ-like person that I know. So those are a couple of my personal resources. Well, I want to share one other with you. Uh, anyone in here familiar with a, a lady by the name of Johnny? Actually, she pronounces it Johnny. Johnny Erickson Tata. She, she is, this is a lady, she's a paraplegic. Actually, I think when she was about 17 years old, she had she dove into the lake and, and hit a rock, and ever since then has been paralyzed. But she's a, a so-called a Christian uh, lady. She, I don't know what her religious, true religious background is, but she has the most beautiful, beautiful voice, and she has a song that she sings. It's entitled "Alone." Yet not alone. There's also been a movie made entitled Alone, Yet Not Alone. And you can get this on the internet easily. You're not going to sing that right now, though, are you? Nothing, pardon? You're not going to sing that right now, though, are you? No, I won't. I won't ruin it. But I'll tell you what, when, when, it talks, when we talk about comfort, and, and as I mentioned, I said, there are different ways that I can glean and gain comfort. And listening to songs is one of them, certainly. Gospel songs. I have a, two or three CDs of the Harding 
university choir singing gospel songs. And when I'm driving the car, or if I'm at home, a lot of times that gives me so, so much peace and so much comfort. Well, in addition, and again, I'm, I told you I wasn't going to tell you a whole lot about myself, but in addition, well, there, there are some other secular, what I would call secular, non-religious hymns and gospel songs that I can listen to that give me comfort. When I'm in, time, in periods and times of sadness, loneliness, and thinking about the past, and I'm not going to tell you, I've, I've got about four or five special songs that just really touch my heart and, and really encourage me. But one of them, is this song by Joni Erickson titled Alone and Not Alone. And it, what it, it, it refers to and what she's singing about is that, okay, I may now be alone. I no longer have my beloved wife with me physically here, but I'm not alone. And the not alone part is the comfort that we can get in knowing that God is here with us. He's always here with us. And we'll see some scripture. Anyway, I just wanted to share those uh, those with you, and uh, certainly always they're very receptive to and, and invited them for any of you to share similar instances and similar sources of comfort or encouragement uh, that, that may be yours if if, if and when you feel comfortable in sharing that publicly. Well, let's talk about hope. Number six on the stages of grief. And, and this is so very, very important. The ultimate resolution for a Christian, and we emphasize this is for a Christian, uh, this is not false hope for us, but the ultimate resolution for a Christian is hope. And I believe everyone in here is a Christian, and so we all have that gift from God, that blessing of hope. The Apostle Paul, several writings, says that it is the anchor of the soul and that it enters in unto that within the veil. And Christians, you and I, are admonished not to sorrow as those who do, have, do not have it. You know, I saw, I don't know how I got this, it was on the internet, just yesterday, a list of uh, uh, actors and professional athletes who are atheists. And I thought, how sad, how, how terribly sad that is that we've got people that they don't have this hope that Christians have. But hope is so important. And let's go to Hebrews 6. We're going to look at several Christian uh, scriptures. And, and these are, the, are, are basically on your outline for class number six, even though we're currently in class number seven. And I'm doing things in a little bit reverse order. We're going down, first of all, if you had your outline with you, we're going to be looking at scriptures of comfort. And then we're going to go back and do number one and two, resources for mourners and grief books that would require the right thinking. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20, we may have strong encouragement. We may have fled for refuge, laying hold of the hope and I've got the word hope, which appears three times in this passage, outlined in red. Laying hold of the hope set before us. That's something laying hold of. That's something we can grasp, that we have access to. This hope we have as an anchor to the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. And we're going to look a little bit deeper about Jesus being a forerunner. Uh, he's waiting for us. He's going to come back and get us. But also in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And we know of those who have fallen asleep in Christ. They perished from a physical standpoint. But it says if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. 
I think it's human for us to have our hope grounded on what's going on in our lives right now and the here and now here on this earth. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the important hope has to do with the eternal aspects of it. Uh, and, and that's what we as Christians have the blessing and the gift of being able to look forward to. Now the Bible provides comfort in many, many ways, and this word comfort we just cannot, cannot overemphasize. Romans 15 verses 4 and 5, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, talking about Scripture, talking about the Old Testament, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So that tells me, that tells each of us that the, the source, the primary source of our hope is that that we glean that we're given to us through Scripture. And it's that where we get that comfort that is tied in with hope. And it continues, he says, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. God is the God not only of patience but also of comfort. We also have hope in a resurrection. So important as we're talking about the resurrection of our souls obviously as well as the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So there's a difference. There's two different classes of individuals that the writer is referring to. Uh, those who have no hope and those who do have hope. But he doesn't want us to be uninformed. And he goes on and says, for if we believe, if we believe, we can have a raising of hands here. How many believe that Jesus died and rose again? If we believe that, and I know everyone in here does, uh, even so, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. He's going to bring those loved ones who have fallen asleep in Jesus along with him in that resurrection. And also in 1 Corinthians 15, Verses 54 and 55. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, i.e. when one passes from this physical life here on this earth, and that's going to happen to all of us, and it already has happened to many that we know, obviously. So it's then, okay, then is an important point. At that point in time shall be brought to pass the saving that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. There's victory that swallows up that death. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Also, continuing, he says, but thanks be to God who given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, reflecting back on what we're talking about here, we're talking about hope. The hope that we all have that is so vitally important for us through this grief management process. And as we stated in our very first class, everyone in here either has, is, or at one time you can be guaranteed that we're going to go through the grieving process and have to deal with the subject of trying to manage that grief. But the but hope is such, such an important part of that. In John 5, 28 29, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. And such a profound, such a, an important, encouraging, comforting passage of scripture as our Lord himself is making this statement. And when I read the Bible, of course I believe everything in, in scripture as we all do, but for some reason, I don't know if it touches you this way, 
but particularly in the Gospels, for some reason when I, when I read something that is an absolute direct quote of my Lord and Savior Jesus, that even hits me more. And that's, that's certainly what's occasion is here. Also, did you know that we're actually promised? Uh, that's a guarantee that we're going to have a home with God. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4, and we referred to this in an earlier class. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, what what more comfort could we ask for than the knowing that, that God is going to be with us, is going to remain with us. We're going to be at home with God. And that's where this eternal aspect of hope comes, comes into play versus that hope that's limited just to the period of time that we're here on this earth. Yes, but I always thought that this one, one statement in Revelation, which goes out of the word, you know, the answer is we have won. We have won. Yeah. That's that victory. That's right. Absolutely. And uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it's hard. And we're not saying by any stretch of the imagination that this journey, this process that, that we're going through, that many of here are going through right now, are dealing with pain and difficulty. And I know that to be the case. And some of you have shared that with me. Personally, one on one, uh, and we all do that, and, and it, it, it's at different points throughout our journey. But this aspect of trying to manage the grief, but staying in the proper relationship with God, so that we know that we've got this absolute victory, the Lord said. We also know that there's going to be rest in heaven. You know, as we've known and had dear loved ones who fought battles illness and disease, who hurt, pain, the heartache, much of which even uh, many of us are going through currently. And here again, I think about these people who are atheists and just have no, I, I, it's just, I feel so sorry for them. I don't, uh, that's the best way I can describe it. But we're guaranteed that we're going to have rest in heaven. And there again, in Revelations again, talking about the future. He says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. But there is that, that guarantee, those who die in the Lord, and as we know many who have done so, that there's going to be that eternal, absolute eternal rest. God also promises that he's going to be with us and he's, he promises that his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, now present, his presence is going to be with us. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said. And I put this in large letters. He, this is our Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Talk about loyalty. Talk about reassurance. Talk about hope. Our, our Heavenly Father, even in spite of, of our weaknesses and our shortcomings. And I've said, I've said this before. Uh, the biggest room in my house, you know, I've got, I've got, you know what the biggest room in my house is? The room for improvement. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 that's true. I mean, we, we've got to be humble and, and recognize that. But nevertheless, even though, in fact, through God's grace and His mercy, and through the cleansing blood and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, they go beyond that, even the spot. And, and I still strive. I want to strive to be the most Christ-like person that I know, and I'll never achieve that, but I'm, I'm trying to improve and, and have that progress a little bit as it go forward. He also says, so that we may boldly say, 
boldly. We can do this with all full, total confidence. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Man can hurt me, he can punish me, he can shoot me in the night in the driveway, just like Pat Scott's husband had happened to her. But uh, that's only temporal. That is only what occurs here on this earth. Man cannot do anything to me from any from standpoint. We also have a promise, an absolute guarantee of a reunion. Uh, I'm not talking about something like a high school reunion. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 17 and 18, then we who are alive and remain, now that talks about those of us who have not departed this earthly life yet. So those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now this is when our Lord comes back. We don't know when that will be. I've heard several of you say, well, I wish it happened right now. Uh, the end is, well, we all wish it would, but you know what? God's got something for us to do. He's got a job for us. And that's the reason we're left here. And that's going to be the focus of our study when we talk about trying to serve, to comfort, and to encourage one another, and to encourage and comfort others. But here again, this promise that we have of this reunion with those that we've lost, those that have gone on before, and that gives me so much comfort. I can't tell you, and I, and I, I know I don't just speak for myself in that regard. Going back again, he says, okay, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I hope that gives you comfort. It certainly gives me comfort just as the Apostle Paul wanted that to be done. Well, okay, with those covered, let, let's talk about very quickly some resources for mourners. And we've talked about mourning previously and that there's nothing wrong with, with mourning, with grieving the loss of loved ones, but the manner in which we handle and deal with that is so, so important. I want to pose a question as we posed this once before. Uh, if any of you have something you want to throw out to us, this is your opportunity. But what are some spiritual resources and some personal resources that you have or that you would utilize? You know, I've shared with you what I do. I kind of laid my soul bare to you. Some of it uh, is very, very personal. Does anyone have any thoughts that you want to share with us that can serve to encourage and help others? I understand. Well, let's just go ahead and talk about some resources. <coughs> some resources for mourners. First, it's so important, and that's what we're trying to do in this class, is to learn about how grief works. So we need to learn to have an understanding so we can, so to speak, have a handle on what this challenge and what this issue is. Uh, I need to also, and I'm going to point the finger to myself on all of these, Bob, you need to develop the right mindset. My attitude, in other words, is so, so important as I try to manage my grief and deal with mourning the loss of love. Bob, what is your mindset? <laughs> my mindset? Well, my, my, my mindset, as I alluded to earlier, and I'll tell you this, and again, I'm getting down in personal. Uh, my wife, Diane, battled cancer for almost four years. For every, virtually every single day that she battled that, I prayed to God and asked him that if it was his will, that he would cure her. And never, ever, not one time did I ever doubt but that it would be his will. How could it not be? From my human thinking, how could it not have been his will to heal her? But do you know what? It wasn't his will to heal her. So my mindset 
then as I wrestled with this, as I thought about that after I lost her, I said, well, God obviously must have something in mind for Bob for the time that he remains here on this earth. And we've already focused a little on the subject of how working through grief might better equip us to comfort others. But my mindset, as weak as I am, and I, by no stretch, do I say that I've got it all figured out. I absolutely do not. It's a, it's a journey. But my mindset is to try, and I don't know if I'm answering your question in, in the context that you asked it, but there's to try to be as positive as I can, but focus and recognize and acknowledge the, the eternal aspect of it. And I know, number one, I know she's not hurting anymore. She's not sick. And I, I know where she is. And I also know that even in spite of my many weaknesses and shortcomings, I know if I have that full confidence, I'm going to be reunited with her one day. And that's what keeps me going. Amanda? I just wanted to say he did heal her. He just didn't heal her the way you wanted him to. I'm sorry. He did heal her. He just didn't heal her the way you wanted him to. So profound. Absolutely true. He did. I appreciate that. That is true. But it is any thoughts? <coughs> Well, I know that, pardon me, when Don was diagnosed, he did not have, I mean, it was, you're going to have this, you're going to die. There's nothing you can do. And so our mindset was just make him as comfortable as he could be. And he had the most wonderful attitude. He was wanting to die because... He had nothing to look forward to. And so uh, different people have different mindsets, of course. But ours was just getting through this. Amen. I appreciate that. I'll share with you something that Ron Bussey and I Friday. Uh, this is with other storm, Wayne Thornton, mm -hmm. Lukenia, and, and, and as they say in his last few days. We visited with him, and was he not? He encouraged me more than I did him because he has that hope. He's ready to go, but he he, he we caught him at a very good time when, they, when he was lucid and able to talk and lying on that bed and, and expressing to us just how thankful he was for having known the truth and, and being in the relationship that he's in. It, it, it you. Yep, definitely. Right, very, just by, as you say, Don had been given the verdict already, and, and you already knew you were. Uh, I appreciate that. It's pretty tough. No, no easy answer. I'm going to go through these last just real quickly. Rely on proven attachments. Attachments having to be with our relationships, our relationships with individuals, family, fellow Christians, and friends. And, and those who have proven themselves, those who are loyal to us, and that can certainly be a great source of encouragement. We need to celebrate the life of the deceased. And uh, there's nothing wrong at all, and I do it daily, daily, but to look back on the life of the loved one and the wonderful ones. And, and even thinking about those wonderful, happy memories as we sort of celebrate, it's, it's both encouraging, but it's also sad. Uh, it strikes me sometimes in that way, but uh, to celebrate the life of the deceased, don't just put them out of your mind. Look for forms of self-expression, ways in which we can outwardly serve to be an encouragement and a service to others. Also, to seek advice and help from others. Don't be too proud, don't be ashamed. Uh, Again, if anyone in here is feeling like the cause of their loss because of their grief, they're ashamed of it, ashamed of how they're handling it, talk to it. We all, it's tough for all of us, it's different for all of us. And we need to get it by us. Look for the good in our lives. Just as you said, man, the good is that they're not hurting anymore. No longer sick. Uh, whatever that good may be. We need to help and strive, and that's the goal. The ultimate goal in this class is for us to help others in dealing with their grief. 
And uh, there again, I think God has a job for each and every one of us. And that's what my mindset, again, as I was saying, is. And we also need to reinvest in our, our new life, our new normal, as we refer to it so often. And not just remove ourselves and divorce ourselves from it. Uh, we'll we'll close out with that. Before you leave that thing, I, mean, I know we didn't die, but Paul said in the first chapter of Philippians, he said, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And I think that's very true sometimes in grief, that things that happened to me personally allowed me to talk to people that I never would have been able to just approach, but to tell them that he was a Christian and why I, I was happy that he wasn't suffering and that kind of thing. People I never would have been talked to, talk to had he not died, they would never would have said anything. So Paul said, even happens. though all those awful things happened to him, it didn't kill him. But those things that happened to him turned out to the presence of the gospel, and I think that ought to be our goal too. Absolutely perfect idea. And I think that goes hand in hand again with the Romans 8 and 28. God works all things together for the good. <coughs> we may not think it's good at the time, but in retrospect, as we suggested earlier, that things that have occurred in our lives, that when it happened, that we, there's no good, absolutely no good that can come from this. Okay, so further down the road, few years, a year, a few years later, we can look back and see what, what has occurred since then, ways in which we may have been able to better serve others that good has indeed come from it. It's not easy. We're not, I'm not up here to pretend and suggest that today we got this all figured out I and mean, just uh, get with it. No, not by any stretch. It, and it's, it's not ever going to go away. But Again, we've got that hope, we've got that guarantee as children of God. And I, I thank God every day for those who've had a positive spiritual influence upon me. Even back from the time when I was 12 years old and I was taught the gospel and I obeyed the, the gospel back then, I, I stopped and think, had that not happened back then, where might I be today spiritually? I don't know. But, but, but my mind, what a journey. Well, Robin, and to the point, all things, not some things, not most things, not a lot of things, all things. And, and when we try to wrap our mind around that, it's hard for us. But God has a plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, sometimes we don't know what it is, but yeah. <laughs> things turn out best. For those who make the best out of the way things turn out. Thank you very much. God bless you. I appreciate you coming.